uh, all welcome in our <laughs> cafe. Uh, the last one during uh, Soundwalk uh, September, which uh, started in Ljubljana and uh, at least uh, as a cafe um, ends in Ljubljana uh, tonight. Uh, we um, are really very uh, punctual now. It's, it's nine o'clock. So um, I invite you to uh, um, to take a drink or to relax a moment. Uh, we'll, be, we'll give it two, three minutes more for people to find their way uh, to the door. And then we will start. <laughs> Well, we are waiting for, for people to join us. Uh, Irene and Brana, would you like to share something about uh, what happened till now in Soundwalk City Prelude in Ljubljana? How did it go? Huh? Uh, so, yeah, we actually did quite a lot of Soundwalks in the couple of weeks, I mean, in the last two weeks, as we said, it's a prelude for us, it's a test mm -hmm. version, it's pilot version. Uh, what I think that every new festival should experience, you know, how to, when is the right time to uh, promote it, uh, how to join the audience and all this stuff. Uh, so actually, uh, tomorrow we have another walk in Karan, this is out of the, the Ljubljana city by Anja Podreka, and then we have the bigger show by uh, Katarina. Katarina is here. She's preparing the show about the artists who couldn't join us in C2, actually, uh, because we also said that uh, for this first year we wouldn't um, invite uh, international artists uh, because of the budget and because of the pandemic reason we didn't really know what's going to be. Uh, so yes, uh, actually we had like uh, four or five walks per week, something like this, isn't it? Or maybe a bit less. Uh, and yeah, everything it goes very well, but uh, important is also that Ljubljana is really crowded nowadays, full of art events, uh, because it was, I mean, this, the state was half of the year as everywhere closed and uh, all of the events are happening now. Uh, so uh, let's say for today you can visit it like, I don't know, five uh, other events uh, in the city. And uh, we are all the time in a kind of a pressure what's going to happen with the epidemic in the next week or in the next week, are they everything going to close down or not? So we are really in a kind of, um, yeah, distress mood. Uh, let's open everything, let's show everything to the people who knows what's going to be in the autumn. Maybe, maybe we, let's just recap that uh, we opened this uh, Soundbox City uh, prelude with uh, Anne Cecile Lee, the, the opening uh, of the sound art piece, uh, Disillusions uh, 2. Uh, at Steklenik. Actually, the Steklenik together uh, is still closed, but we kind of open it uh, uh, by walk and uh, uh, having uh, a short sound walk of uh, listening a couple of people attended uh, to listen to her piece uh, uh, on headphones. Uh, then we had uh, till now three sound walks. Uh, tomorrow is another one, and we will conclude with, uh, with another sound walk uh, by Anthony at the end of uh, this uh, program uh, on 5th of October. Um, and uh, maybe, I don't know, I forgot uh, in here, Irena, if you said that uh, Katarina will do this two hour broadcast on national radio station about this, uh, some artists that 
they did not, uh, I mean, I can invite them to be. But I'm going to speak louder a bit. Okay, I have to remove some of my stuff from the keyboard, I guess. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, uh, and of course uh, we had. Uh, now we have the second cafe uh, within the Walk, Listen, Create uh, platform. Um, the first one with, was again with NC uh like a couple of weeks ago, and we had a, um, uh, a workshop by Barak uh, on Saturday. Uh, uh, and using his delivery application. So I think that that was basically it. Brane, maybe you can uh, hi. I was eating, and Brane is not allowing me to show in front of the camera if I'm eating. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, Anne Cecile Lee um, exhibition is a part of Acoustic Commons project. So we are partners of this international project. Europe. And uh, Creative okay. Euro, part of the Creative Europe, yes, and um, actually the whole festival is as well a part of um, this program, so, yeah. And there's around... And uh, my broadcast will be uh, on 13 of October on uh, program uh, R. So it's a program for classical music uh, on the national radio in Slovenia, and it's uh, in the process of becoming a lovely broadcast. We don't hear you, Geert. Okay. So, uh, as Brani already said, uh, uh, Soundbox September is biting in its own tail by uh, uh, coming back to Ljubljana in the last days, starting with a very in-depth uh, uh, conversation with uh, Anse Sili uh, Lee, uh, and now uh, with uh, uh, Yasmina Zaloznik. Uh, the, the program we had in our virtual cafe uh, was embracing the, uh, the many uh, the physical uh, walking activities, sound walking activities in Ljubljana, where you could uh, enjoy uh, being outdoors uh, physically. Uh, as well in Athens here, it's incredible how to see how many people are streaming outside, meeting each other, walking in the city, going to museums. Uh, it's like an, uh, a new discovery of the of being outside again. And, um, and we hope that, that next year we will have in Ljubljana and uh, maybe in other places as well the opportunity to have uh, real physical cafes together. Uh, we are in the cafe, so I will be your uh, uh, bartender for tonight. Uh, uh, I um, will... Um, uh, the, the cafe, the idea of a cafe is, as a reality, a place of, of, of conversation, talking, not only um, listening to the provocation of Yasmina uh, that she will uh, uh, give us in a moment, but as well to have a horizontal discussion, exchange of your practices, your ideas, uh, stimulated by the ideas of Yasmina and what is emerging during our conversation. Uh, there is no beginning, no end. Uh, you can interrupt after Yasmina's uh, conversation. You're free to, to talk about any uh, topic that is related to um, um, what is emerging in this cafe. And uh, I'm sure that we will have a very deep conversation. Um, Yasmina's work uh, is about embodiment, is about stillness, about movement uh, in an interior world, There's an inversion of movement, inversion of um, the um, of the experience of, of, of going somewhere, but as well uh, finding a way to move inside of you. Uh, so. Um, many things to, 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 to talk about in this world of change, uh, where slowness unfortunately became a reality, uh, another reality than we had uh, seen and felt it uh, before, uh, and where embodiment unfortunately as well became something that we are uh, having the desire for, but not always the possibility to experience on this moment by being so much isolated from the a real world. Um, Yasmina Zaloznik, I'm uh, giving you 
now at the stage to talk about uh, your work and your ideas. But... Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would first like to say that I will be reading uh, because it's like something that is read uh, or that I've written. It's the text that you can find find in the chat already. And uh, you can download or open this PDF and uh, browse until the second part of the booklet because the, at the beginning there is like Slovene version, which I think most of you don't understand. And the second, it's like the English version. And I will kind of condense uh, now here. And I would like to also say that I'm not a sound artist. So it's more like, let's say, theoretical kind of approach to and also experience. Uh, as an audience member and also as like a dramaturg uh, working in the dance field and uh, a theorist working uh, mainly in the field of dance or like kind of body practices are those that I'm looking for especially and trying to think the world uh, through my kind of embodied experience. Uh, so it's kind of, I will start that, it's kind of paradoxical uh, that we are sitting in the environment that I will criticize in this uh, paper or talk, uh, which only also shows uh, that on theoretical level, uh, it is much easier actually to think of some uh, concepts uh, than actually to put them into practice in our everyday life. Of course, uh, it is not that I'm kind of avoiding all the technology because it's impossible today. And of course, I'm present uh, in many Zoom meetings and uh, uh, I'm also uh, hanged in this kind of virtual world on, on daily level and my phone is glued to my hands uh, most, of my, uh, most of the day, but still. So uh, our life uh, has, far, uh, has for rather a while became defined by the ideology of constant progress and digital communication instead of fertility of a dialogue. Our lives are interrupted and defined by economic and natural disasters, wild climate changes, pandemics, increased precarity, solitariness, and immunization. The negative consequences of globalism combined with turbo or necrocapitalism have only brought us to the ruins of the welfare state as one of the last mechanisms that could secure a healthy social body embraced by multidimensional life instead of pushing us to the edges of the mere survival. No matter how much harsh uh, criticism of capitalism has been produced, no matter what number of forms of struggles, on the other hand, have been, uh, has been initiated since the 80s when the neoliberal agenda unfolded its true face. Let's remind us on the, this very famous statement of Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. It seems harder than ever actually to imagine a way out of capitalism despite its terrifying mechanisms. We are constantly reminded of our powerlessness and fleetingness of any alternative initiation. However, such struggles initiated by activists, by artists, or whomever should be foreseen, nurtured and extended, not only to give hope, but rather as a proof of the possibility to change things, to change us, to change the other, and consequently the world. It is our responsibility and obligation, I would claim, to nurture a potential of change, Maybe that sounds naive, maybe, but it is also true that intimate and shared experiences are speaking differently. And as do our experience, so the discourse has the energy to become contagious, which is also my intimate reason to persist in experimental minor practices that nurture my senses, my ethical position, my vision and my action. One of the potent po form for nurturing our bodies and inner dialogue and a relation to where the surrounding as the other are sound box or sound box performances among many other forms. Uh, just to, to, to give a point, but I will came to that like by giving like a longer detour to sketch kind of contextualized the context to, to give a con contextualized frame before moving to this kind of specific art form. 
In my opinion, uh, sound walks are just one of, ma of many or among those forms that produce a crack in the space-time of our daily lives and its rhythm. It is ne necessary to, to stress that this talk uh, or contribution does not aim to be kind of analytical, scientific, but it's more or less my personal self-reflection of sound walk performances that evade representation and rather focus on the experience and its embodiment. The mentioned experience and excavated insight of the present analysis are felt by my professional occupation and personal interest in the potentiality of art practices to synthesize the public and thereby strengthen the disappearing public sphere. The question of crossing to the virtual world, which reached a new peak with the pandemic of SARS-CoV-2 and recent lockdowns, could be better understood through the key parameters of the speed ideology in the postmodernist era, as outlined by Paul Virilio or Peter Sloterdijk, for example. Virilio claimed that uh, accelerated reality, which in many ways is a mediated reality, is a significant mutation in history. This thesis should be read and implemented through a significant obser observation of famous Hannah Arendt and her iconic book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, stating that terror means the, re the realization of the law of movement. Its objective is to enable the force of nature or history to wheel freely through humanity without being hindered by any spontaneous human act. With this finding, we must also consider that acceleration in capitalism and observe the speed and simulation that dictates our lives. With continuous acceleration, we have achieved a staggering speed in digital world, comparable with the speed of light. With immediate interactivity and accelerated reality, we still move the boundaries of the present, the boundaries of the human thought and even human being, and time. Society should be aware of these limits and the limits of such acceleration, and also trying stopping it or slowing it down, or even consciously stepping out of it as the only possibility to preserve the multifacedness and richness of life, life is codependent on the connect, connect, connections and intertwining of our lives with different temporalities and chronopolitics. With various temporalities, I'm referring to cycling time defined by oppositions like day and la, uh, uh, leisure time or uh, working time, day and night, of course, different seasons, etc. The cycling time that have been gradually re replaced uh, by the linear law of 24-7, defined by the logic of synchronization, in which we are trapped through attachment and dependence on the digitized world and where the dialogue spontaneous encounter with others is replaced by, by mediated communication. The first has already radically devastated multi-rhythm and leveled it into arithmicality, which means that further struggle should focus on the politicization of life, understood in its complexity as, as a multifaceted and dynamic interplay of different temporalities and in the, uh, the ruined and shrunken public spaces. With other words, we have to relearn to occupy not only spaces, but also time. Immobility. It is necessary to add that the propaganda policy of speed and progress has not only entered the mental and emotional social consciousness, but also our kinetics. Our immobile body, as now, for example, are attached to fragmented virtual communication networks, which at the same time impose a feeling of constant lagging behind. Just let us remind how many emails now, just maybe in five minutes, we have now in our inboxes. How many unwritten news, too many open tabs in the, in the browsers, non-upgraded virtual profiles, 
the inability to stay in co contact with whomever we would like to. Even more, the attachment to digital networks and virtual worlds has not only produced the inability to catch up with uh, up-to-date information, but also flatter, flattened our perception of reality. Screens are, according to Paul Virilio, like windshields in a car. With increased speed, we lose the sense of lateralization, which is an infirmity in our being in the world, its richness, its relief, its depth of field. There is a, there is a loss of visual field and the anticipation of what really surrounds us. Present and present. Preparation for a new era were produced for quite a while, but we have ignored the warnings that appear already in the transition of the 70s to the 80s, especially with the famous and widely readable simulacra and simulation by Jean Baudrillard, which was published in 1981. There is a gap, if not even an opposition between presence and the present. The present, what we present somehow, simulates presence and introduce simul simulation or the simulacrum to recall Baudrillard. It has become part of our social practice, reaching a new swing within the recent lockdowns. Understanding these differences, we have to further follow Baudrillard's and Henri Lefebvre, for, for example, showing how the representation as a certain and today common presentation of mediated reality started to furnish and occupy time by simulating and dissimulating the living. But presence is not held in the image, as the present presence exists in a dialogue. The use of time, speech and action, while, uh, while with the present, which exists in the digital, there is only exchange and the acceptance of exchange, of the displacement of the self and the other by a product, by a simulacrum. In that regard, one should be aware that the present is a fact and an effect of commerce, while presence situates itself in the poetic, in value and creation, situation in the world, and not only in the relation of exchange. So if we just uh, remember how we, we are producing our images uh, on the Facebook, for example, or Instagram, wherever, we are producing something, but we are not there present at, in any way. So with the pandemic, only an apparent shift in the continuum of this accelerated reality has occurred. We have eased the movement restriction by intensifying our attendance on digital platforms and increased consumption of the mediated reality. The activities that contributed to heterogeneity and multifaceted nature of our social life, including life artistic practices, have been replaced by or swallowed by, by approximation transmitted to the virtual worlds. In this way, as already emphasized, we have disabled dialogue as a means of spontaneous, evolving for mutual enrichment, learning as well as personal and collecting growth uh, that extends beyond language and representation. So I would like to here just to remind us on a very nice world that uh, Martin Heidegger uh, created and it's Dasein, which is translated somehow being here or something like that. And that's the dialogue that when we are here, we are actually very present. We are, our presences are nurtured and we see each other, we feel each other. It's, it's affection that goes and it's something beyond, that goes like far beyond the language. So, and in the time when the dialogue is kind of interrupted, the, the humanity is shifted somehow. It's losing itself and it's transforming to something different. Transgressing body into a shell. We all know that necrocapitalism is in favor of shallowness. It likes isolated and alienated physicalities. The tendency is to extend technology to the fields that have been alien to it and uh, therefore this cannot surprise us. 
this kind of gap that came and this kind of force that or the way we were enforced to transform our practices into something that was digital was just one step forward in this way of acceleration. So the question is how to get out of our immobile bodies, how to infuse our bodies with life and presence. One of the simplest answer could be uh, could be found in open spaces, in public, in being mo moved, moving uh, by others, by the surroundings, engaged in a form of dialogue and through a resurrection of our senses, through relearning, actually, to be alert, to embrace relations with the surroundings. Although there are many ways to engage oneself in movement and in relation, the appropriate forms that were possible as practice, even during restrictions, uh, were actually walking. And sound walking is actually a form that could be used or was the form that was used also in the lockdowns periods. I see them as a platform or, or a form through which we can observe vitalization of our corporeality as relational, as sensitive, as as sensible altogether. Rebecca Solnit, in her wonderful book, Wanderlust, A History of Walking, wrote, walking idly is a state in which the mind, the body, and the world are aligned. As thought, there were three characters finally in conversation together, three notes suddenly making a chord. Walking allows us to be in our bodies in the world without being made busy by them. However, we apply various rhythms in our walks and we apply these rhythms to our state of being, perceiving and presences. Walking tells us a lot about the varieties and differences in which we are encountering ourselves and the world. Even more, with and through walking, we are nurturing the lived experience of speciality, temporality, corporeality, and relationality. In other words, walking references our phenomenological, phenomenological experience of lived space, including uh, its psychological and physiological dimensions, its various tempos and rhythms, our diverse and complex sensorial ex experiences and the relation toward our surrounding, the potency of the moment and the importance of the instant. In that regard, the walk is a political act. When we walk slowly, without the attachment to the social and digital networks, rushing without rushing to the, to the meeting or the office, we get the feeling that we are stretching the time that we finally can breathe normally, that accelerated reality by which we are driven steps aside and we are finally capable of encountering the world that surrounds us. It is an urge to be present when walking to really encounter the world. This presence situates itself in the poetic to repeat, its value, its creation, its situation in the world and not only in the relation of exchange. Although not every walk is necessary, a uh, sound walk, of course, the focus on the sound with its excursion and purpose of listening to the environment can add to the experience of the walk. Therefore, it is not an accident that the sound walk has gained in popularity, not only because the technology that is used for sound walks has become more handy, but the technology used for sound walks or, or sound walk performances has somehow hacked its capitalistic purpose. With rather affordable handy mobile technology that both captures and replace an auditory environment, sound walks have become a handy political tool and a form that can help resenticize the public, nurture a healthy relationship toward one's inside and outside of the known and unknown, of presences instead of images. Attentiveness is a keyword for a shift to be created in the process of communitarization and decolonialization. 
the attentiveness that has first been in the process of colonization taken away from non-human entities and soon after, af after applied further to other not yet humans through the process of racialization. Returning to ind indigenous knowledges and their worldviews, their relation to nature, human and non-human entities should therefore be a leading perspective of every art form. It is highly embraced in the form of sound walk, I would say, providing us with an exceptional experience of juxtaposed temporalities, of various bodies, rhythms, hidden and visible, of now and then, of past and present, of here and there, etc. Soundwalk can at the same time be considered as a method and a form used by artists and scientists to make us alert to the surrounding, to the environment. As the artist Andrew Brown acknowledges, the soundwalk can be considered as a form of mapping experience, both in relation to reiterative process of listening to, gathering and assembling so sounds, but also in the form of the plethora of life maps created by, by participants responding to both the tangible and associative features of the environment. The soundwalk performances could be created by various pre-recorded sound and soundscapes, which can be as well intertwined with the, the narration. The recorded sounds are always uh, are always from the past, which makes a sound walk composed of various temporalities, at least juxtaposed, posing the recent past and present time of each walk. This enables us to navigate these different temporalities, to imaginatively and sonically travel through time, functioning as snapshots of forever changing land and soundscapes through evolving technologies, communities, and social practices. I'm quoting here again artist Andrew Brown. If the sound walk performance includes the narrative, it is the narrator who speaks slowly, focuses on longer pauses, and that the narration is composed as a form of poetry instead of a short story or a novel. With abstraction and repetitions, the story opens up toward the imagination instead of enforcing a clear statement and conclusions. It is exactly sound walk that have given me the experience of value, valuing extending time, showing the, uh, slowing down my steps and opening up myself toward the outside. I learned to enjoy being lost in the city long ago, to turn my gaze upwards from time to time, consciously deciding to use different paths and enter the hidden squares and gardens wherever and whenever possible. However, with the sound walk, I learned there, there is a whole new reality that is hidden from my view. The soundscapes, the melody of the corner, street, or the city. I learned to listen and admire what seems to be hidden as it, <clears throat> as it is too small or too delicate to be acknowledged right away. I learned to take time to embrace what is there, to gently touch various texture that I rarely thought of. Such experience is never only mental. Even if you cannot recall and translate the experience into words and language, you know it is embodied, especially since or when it is holistic experience. With some recent participatory dance performances, I learned that what you get back is always in relation to what you give. And when you are somewhere really present with your entire presence, the embodied experience is, is more grounded in, and lasting, whether you are aware or unaware of it. The openness toward what is there opens up a space for a dialogue, no matter if it is based on language or some other senses. Experiencing such openings, one should be prepared for the challenges, acceptance of temporal limitations and narrowness of our constructed knowledges. As, a as in a dialogue, we can grow individually and as a society or community. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmina. 
now switching back from your uh, wonderful text to the faces that have read the text. Uh, I, um, um, the floor is open for any discussion, uh, feedback, comment you may have on this, uh, on these stimulating ideas. We have here two questions already, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Julian Barbour, the theoretical uh, physicist in his book, The End of Time, argues the case for there not being anything as time. Paul Pot studied phenome phenomenology at the Sorbonne in the 50s, announced the return to year zero with the Khmer Roche. This renouncement of time reflects a controversial take on life within a broader context, the cosmos, has been systematically reje rejected by the West. Uh, what is my opinion about that? Oof. Mm. I mean, there are many, many, many different uh, theories of time uh, or on time. Uh, of course, there is also in the quantum physics, there are these theories of parallel uh, time zones or that we are just like having a feeling that we are actually always in different temporalities and different kind of worlds existing, coexisting. But I would say that I'm, because I'm more materialist in, in my um, perspective, I would, uh, I would go to, to what I experience in everyday life and how I experience this difference uh, through, the, through the time and space in which I was born and I'm living in. And uh, I wouldn't go to this kind of cosmology and uh, things like that because they're too far. And I would nurture first our re reality um, and even if there are many theories uh, spreading around now about this kind of, that we are projecting everything and, you know, that, that the world exists only through our projections, I think that we are sharing something that is common and this is still um, <clears throat> something that we, we, we can hang on to together. Uh, so that's my... Uh, my maybe very simple or simplistic uh, answer, but yeah, first is is the is the body that is here that I feel, uh, and the rest is like something that it's out, and that's the next step that we have to handle somehow. Um, can I can I can I ask you a question as a follow up? Yes. Um, it sounds a little. I don't. I've only. I haven't really. Uh, wrestle with the, the essay yet, so I haven't got my head around the scientific arguments for the end of time. But it's based in in the the serenity of the cosmos, and I'm just wondering. I don't see why you need. I mean, Suzanne, it's his art. Took a similar stance of timelessness, not of time. And I'm just wondering, I wouldn't divorce it from being here and now. I think it's very mundane, very much a matter of fact. And that this is my projection, but it's not a very good one. Time is a construct, essentially. Um, that, that, I don't think that's a good way for us necessarily to define ourselves. I think I could define you as uh, uh, being in, in, in space, but I'd have problems in defining you as a, 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 a person in time. I think it's, uh, I think it's in, in question. And I don't think to, uh, that, that challenges, I don't think it's a theoretical about their idea, but I think it's very basic and uh, uh, almost a phenomenological argument. And very much one which the Walk, Listen Cafe, uh, which is what I would identify with and my interest in it, is the timelessness of walking and the state we get in in that process isn't one that's time bound. It's to do with, with, with much bigger issues. Um, I don't know what to, what to add. It's like, I think it's a perception of something, but 
as I said, I'm very much based in, in you know, seeing my daily life, and that was that was my entering point into the whole thing, like reading well, all this. Thank you very things. much. Thank you. Thank you also for your comment. Anyway, I think, uh, Bob, we can sort of return to your uh, to your roots, uh, which is in the performance art in the 60s and 70s, uh, um, because the, the whole walking arts discipline originated from the 60s. First in, in the dance, as you know, as Mina, uh, where uh, certainly the daily gesture uh, and, uh, became part of the dance practice, including walking. And then in the sound art, which was in the beginning very much, um, uh, let's say, rooted into into performative practices, like in the listen, uh, the the performance where um, uh, the name escaped now from the artist, but he invited people to uh, he painted the word listen on their hands and sent them to specific places in New York to stand and with the hand uh, stretched and and listen. Um, which uh, was more than about just uh, acoustical aspect, but about uh, being in place and being connected with place and, um, and walking as a way of, 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 of augmenting awareness. Um, the, the elements that, as you, as you mentioned, of uh, the modern human world and to relate with the modern human world um, uh, is something that became part of the walking arts in the 21st century. So making a bridge between these two, um, uh, two uh, let's say, approaches uh, in walking art. Walking art that is now more, really more directed to, to the being aware of, of the planetary um, uh, crisis. And, and uh, uh, so the, but anyway, sorry, Bob, I was deviating and, um, um, uh, but uh, the, in that sense, I, I feel very strongly leaning towards your, your point that working art and sound working is a performative act, although it has its, also has its parallel world and the acoustic ecology. And, um, and the whole body is involved. You don't you not only listen with, with, with your ears, you, you listen with, with the completeness of your being, uh, of your sensory being uh, in the city. And Bob, uh, Bob, that's something that is very much important in your work as well. Um, this completeness and this listening beyond uh, the the ears. Um, anyway, this is more like a thought that came up to me, and maybe something that opens a further discussion. Uh, I mean, I may add some question, or maybe it's more just a comment. Um, because I really understand this your approach, a kind of holistic understanding of space and time and body inside. And um, maybe I would like to open uh, the debate. Uh, how do you see, I mean, maybe all of you as well, the public space in the context of the text of what we were heard? Or better, um, what about the public time? Because it's not, I mean, I heard it, we heard now that this time can be just a construction. But anyway, I think that this, uh, with freedom of walking, we anyhow enter to the time, if we want or not. It's not just a space, but it's also a time of listening. No, Robert, you disagree? Uh, so I'm just thinking, where, where is the time and where is this public time in uh, regarding to the walking? Yeah. This uh, public time was the term that uh, somehow with, with, uh, with uh, my very good colleague of mine and uh, collaborator, Og Weber, we were like kind of discussing uh, quite, uh, quite a lot because looking at all this kind of privatization and shrinking of uh, the, we have public, public uh, spaces, public sphere, which is arose, er, arose the, the public space, it's also kind of, it's more and more uh, privatized, even like if it doesn't belong to the corporation, it belongs to the state or someone that is like kind of, you know, the privileged, uh, privileged society somehow, or even the, the mayors uh, or the city's uh, councils are kind of grabbing them and, you know, like making this into something else, like a kind of a property for t t tourists and like kind of trying to uh, get rid of the of, of the of the uh, of the citizens 
somehow. And we saw this kind of controlling uh, and uh, ero erosion of uh, public uh, public spaces uh, in Slovenia, especially with all these kind of demonstrations that we had for almost a year now, uh, or even more. I'm not uh, certain any longer because it it seems that it's a century already. Uh, that that every Friday there's like a cycling uh, protests, and uh, even if we were allowed to walk uh, uh, in the in, like during the lockdown, we were not limited on the kilometers around our houses. Um, uh, this this protests were forbidden, even if people took or actually really care about this kind of proximities and distances, physical distances b between one another. But, but to come to the, to the public time, actually, that, uh, that we started to think of, uh, there are like two entrance points to, to this te terminology. And one is actually coming from uh, so socialist experience uh, or socialism in Yugoslavia, where we had this kind of working br brigades and, you know, like all the railways and uh, things were kind of built during, like after the World War, war and people really dedicated their time to, to, to give it to the public good. Uh, and then the second uh, ent entrance point uh, are like uh, debates that are going on for quite a while now already, uh, are the, 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 the debates about the universal basic income. And I think with the, uh, with the universal basic income, uh, of course, uh, we, would, we would have more, we would get somehow more time, somehow more time that we could share or give to the, let's say, to the operations or volunteering in different systems to nurture others or helping people around or whatever, to share our knowledges that go beyond the labor somehow, um, like the wage, the, 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 yeah, the labor for, for a wage. And uh, with the precarization, uh, of course, people are shrinked uh, into to, to their kind of everyday uh, surviving modes, uh, working over hours uh, uh, in, <clears throat> in very bad conditions, even shelter houses uh, in America, many people with like minimum wage cannot afford to, to pay for the housing system or to afford like uh, a life worth living. So these are like kind of two, two entrance points to this kind of public time, and I think I understand public time, that it's a time that is given to the public good. Oh, super. Oh, nice. I mean, not just nice, but it's really, thank you very much, yeah. Super idea. That's, I mean, that we are started to talk about public time, not just public space. I'll come in again. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, um, the, the Yugoslavian performance artist Maria Abramovic talks about her what moved her were a combination of, of of communism and spirituality, and the um, I can't remember his name. He's he, he's Zimbabwean, and he was teaching at St Martin's School of Art, and he got the sack for physically eating this very famous art tract and he ate it page by page and he's he he again talks about um, space over time I, I just a feeling that it seems in relation to time in relation to space time seems to me I don't know with my art training and everything insignificant it doesn't seem to resonate in the same way Space is like physical; it's there. You can touch it. Time, I don't. Yeah, I mean, Newton wrote. I mean, it's, it's more. It's much more complex. The other one's much more fundamental. That's, that's. It's something to grasp onto. Something that's, you know, that we all experience. Yeah, but Robert, may I just as, uh, add a little bit to that? Because it's the same with the space. I mean, if you perceive the space in this architecture potential that is a uh, volume between two walls or, you know, 
this is one thing. If you perceive the space in the more urbanism way or in the more nat nature way, it's another thing. And it's uh, somehow meet the time. This, so maybe we are talking about the same substance, you know, this space and time. I don't know. I would disagree with 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 you, Irena, somehow. But I think that you know the if we are occupying only territory, if we have like a state without the history, what do we have then? It is like it's a it's a true question, like for me, because we are seeing now like with all the authori author authoritarian regimes that they are trying to, to recapture or like rewrite the history or get rid of it. Like whatever they are not fond of, they are rewriting like in a very strong and, uh, uh, and harsh way. Like for example, I will just give like example, the example is Kopje uh, 2014. It's, it was like the project named and uh, they, uh, they rebuilt it, the, whole, uh, the, the whole center of, of Skopje. And they created like kind of statues that seem to be like kind of coming from ancient times. Mm. But you see that pro pro proximities between these kind of statues are very wrong. And the ideology uh, um, uh, that comes with that is also very, very strong and very wrong. It's very, you know, what, what they want to, to, to be left for the new generation or the, the people will forget about some of their past and they will have like completely different point of view or understanding of their history. Yeah, but there, there are two aspects of totalitarianism. There's force and force is that which has implemented uh, uh, dictatorships all through the world. But the other side and the unexplored side is energy. And energy is fueled, fueled not by force, but by human enthusiasm. And that's a side of totalitarianism that's t totally unrepresented, not even thought about. And I would contend that this is ties in with this idea of not seeing space as time bound. I don't. Do you want me to... mm, can you? Yeah. Well, I've tried to because I've never thought this before. I was literally thinking on my feet now. I mean. Um, um, for example, the, the, the French Communist Party is Stalinist, and um, that's where, where Pol Pot got his ideas from, basically, from French culture. Uh, um, and th that was an exemplar, as you say, of, of totalitarianism with, with Skopje, the, the most beautiful city in Europe before the earthquake being, you know, re remade into this corporate mess, sort of thing. But, um, it's like if you think of the communist revolution, it was designed for a uh, proletarian society. It's not agrarian ones. It's a noble cause that has never had a chance to be tried out, actually, historically. It's the first working class movement the world has ever seen. Uh, and it's never been given a, 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 any, any, any ability to be, be actually used, you know, realistically. I mean, communism was doomed to failure after the 17 revolution from the start because there was no backing for it. But the principles or socialism, whatever you want to call it, I think are found. I mean, it's not that far from Christianity, really, the, the sort of principles. And it believes in equality rather than the capitalist notion of, of freedom. I mean, it, sure, give you freedom, but after you've had equality, <laughs> give everyone an equal chance. And I think, I don't know, it's just um, then taking that out to this notion of sound. Well, take Malevich. And his architectonics, those um, they're sort of idealistic architectural structures. They're to me timeless, or his suprematism is timeless. It, it's geometric, if you like. He uses geometry, and yeah, it, 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 it's without reference. I mean, the one constant we have. I mean, and I'd, I'd buy into this. It's a very materialistic one. Is is place. You know, this is the universe. This is, this is unquestionable. Yeah, this is this is timeless. It, it's here and always will be here. I mean, it's a controversial point of view, but I yeah. think it's a, a sort of more one that's egalitarian as an idea than than, than 
than other ideas. I just think it's, um, it's on that level I can relate to it. I can't, all I know is a development that was in Malevich's uh, architectonics. And I think he was on a, on a plane with Einstein in his thinking. He's very advanced thinker. And um, I don't know the implications of, of taking those further. You know, i.e. you say space is between these two walls and then space is, is experienced in nature. Well, I don't see a, a, a discrepancy between space in nature and the space between two neural walls. It's the same space. One which is inhabited is, by uh, things that grow. The last sentence I didn't understand, I'm sorry. Uh, you said, I don't see the difference. Well, um, Irena said that she understands space roughly as being something that exists between two places, two points, or two walls or whatever. It has no, I just wanted to stress maybe about the volume of the space, that we are not talking about just the, about the the emptiness in the space, but about the volume. I know how to shrink this volume around, uh, let's say, a bigger scale. I mean, actually, the, the space is more like a um, mechanism of scale also. And at that point, we can very simply came to the time. And that's why I said that maybe we are talking about the same uh, dimension. Does it I, I, sorry, I didn't, quite, I didn't quite catch your point. Would you mind saying it again? I didn't quite... Yeah, that, uh, I said that um, while we're talk talking about the space, it's a, a dimensional question. You know, where you see the space and exactly when you're entering to this dimensional, is if, if it's in a city or in a larger scale or just in, I don't know, in a room or somewhere else, then you're going to the time quite quickly. And that's why I think that uh, somehow it's really linked together. I don't, I don't understand where space in a city or in nature is necessarily time bound. I, I don't, I don't, I don't follow that. It's there. I mean, space was there before a city was built. The space was, it's always there. It's yes, neither negative nor positive. It's space. Yeah, but, but I don't think you can see see a space without. Uh, uh, seeing its time uh, as, an, as, a, as a fourth dimension uh, as well. Uh, and even more than in the, in the, uh, let's say the, the connection with, with deep time, the modern human time, uh, that uh, the place that, the, the, let's say, the planet where we are, it doesn't make sense if we, are, we cannot connect with what was before us and what will be after us as humans. Um, so um, without uh, connection with time, you cannot connect with the place where you are. That's how I see it. Yeah, the element of deep time is something that is coming more and more part of the locative media or the, uh, also the soundwalk experience. And how to um, how to create a soundwalk experience or a walking experience that is more than a human experience, but it's literally a more than human experience it's that, that connects you with alternative forms of knowing um, and uh, being part of the world. So maybe that's that's another element. Um, uh, in this discussion that, that, that is going more about, let's say, a human time or a, a historical time in, a, in the human perspective. Um, and I think you have to see see it broader than that, than in the, than the human perspective. Uh, that, I'm aware of the mapping in, in terms of uh, 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 our movement, but I'm not aware of deep time. Could you say a little bit more about the definition of what it is or what, what you, you would uh, uh, approximate it to be? Yes, uh, deep time you can uh, can define as a time that is going beyond the human scale uh, and uh, human history. Uh, so to connect with deep uh, deep time is actually going seeing uh, that say a connection between the between our our, um, our existence and to the the earliest uh, uh, manifestations of matter. Uh, so and how can we relate to that? How we can feel part of that? Uh, be feeling part of of what happened just after the Big Bang, matter of speaking, and um, how to embody that uh, literally. Well, we surely, by being in space, we naturally embody it. We don't need to, uh, because it's the same time. The time now was the time, pretty much, that was created after the Big Bang. Or, I mean, the t space, sorry. I, I'm saying the, mm -hmm. 
because the space we inhabit is the same space that was here, isn't it? Well, that, that's a constant. I mean, maybe that's a variable. I don't know. But um, just oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll back out here because I can't. <laughs> no, that, no, no, it's fascinating uh, to, to see how to, to find the ways to bring time and space together uh, on yeah. various layers and, and various layers of dimensions. Uh, it's what anybody I else want to, to try to do, this? wasn't it? It's what science is. It, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah. what is it? Um, micro and macro, isn't it? That you, it how do you resolve the two? But, um, As well, embodiment. Uh, Mine to, is to going to a form of. Not, uh, yes? Yeah. To, to come to a to, to form be a of knowledge. To mm. Sorry. Uh, now, it's as well uh, to, uh, to what Yasmina is talking about, embodiment, uh, is, is a way of not, is, is, an, is an alternative way of knowing uh, how to know to your body, to in, uh, for one side being aware uh, with, with, with all your senses, but as well as uh, seeing uh, science is not so only limited to the theoretical framework, specifically the Western framework, but as well uh, as Yasmina pointed out to the indigenous um, forms of knowledge and uh, uh, ways of knowledge that, that could that are going beyond the rational, um, uh, the, the rational methodologies. Well, I can see um, the spatial so. links with 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 indigenous. But I don't get the, the time one. I'm sorry. I, uh, but but uh, time is part of the whole universe of, of the indigenous people. Look to the uh, the song lines. Look to those, the Australian Aboriginals uh, that uh, uh, for who. Uh, traveling in time is as real as traveling in, in space, um, which we may have lost because we started to think in a more horizontal way, um, and uh, like, like going from point A to B to C uh, on a directional way. And, um, but I think uh, the tentacular thinking, uh, more uh, like um, uh, rhizomatic thinking, multidimensional thinking, involves as well uh, uh, taking distance from this. Um, uh, Unidirectional, um, the very. Uh, um, the, yeah, my my uh, point here would be though. For, for, sorry, okay, cutting in. Here. My point here would be that. Oh gosh, um, oh, I sorry, I've sorry, forgotten it. Oh no, um, oh oh, I had it. Then. It's something. Let's go. Pol Pot. I want to go back to Pol Pot. Oh, I know. Cambodia. Angkor Wat disappeared onto a pla another plane of existence in the 12th century. That this is the esoteric knowledge. And Pol Pot's statement was, was a, a statement against time travel, i.e., which is, you know, Cambodian, the Khmers have the secret to time tra travel. This is, I spent my whole lifetime uh, investigating this. But what Pol Pot did, he renounced it, he negated it. He, he, he nihilistic as a Stalinist stance. So this is the element of socialism that, that, that denies time in the face of great civilization. And I'm just wondering what the rejection of time, what that might, just as an, an academic exercise, if you like, what that might um, uh, free up, sort of thing. I mean, what it freed up in 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 in, in Cambodia were the killing fields, but which were as a consequence of the American psychic intervention. That, 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 that basically, well, I won't use the word. It starts with F. The whole place up, and um, that it wasn't, you know, what was happening inside. But as he st was studying ph phenomenology, he knew what he was doing in terms of the whole tradition of time travel in, in Angkor. And the West haven't got a clue what he was doing. You know, they just labelled it something. But um, I just, I just, I think it's a fascinating subject, an area of. You know, now's the time to question Einstein and this notion of time and, and the fourth dimension and that. I don't know. It's just my way of thinking, that's all. Thank you. Anybody else? I think I'm going to bring out the discussion of time, if I may. Okay, yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, although I do have one thing to say uh, on it. Uh, I like the concept of public time, conceptually, uh, but Yasmina, the way you were describing it, uh, it sounds to me like uh, volunteering. Uh, but, uh, yes, yes. but <laughs> oh, great, <laughs> thanks. Uh, but my question, I have a question, but it's not about uh, public time. Um, it's about uh, a, um, a concept you mentioned twice, and once uh, you threw in an extra adjective. Early on, you uh, used the term turbo necro. Capitalism, and then later on you repeated necro-capitalism. 
Uh, now, I can imagine why capitalism uh, would be uh, given the adjective turbo, uh, but I would like to hear why you also give it the adjective macro. I mean, it's a term that comes from philosophy and from like African uh, uh, theorist uh, member, and uh, he was like uh, saying, you know, how much actually this kind of capitalism is actually going, or uh, yeah, it's actually not. Uh, uh, now I'm a bit uh, uh, because I'm not prepared, and I'm usually, you know, li like to quote or or things like that, the definition. And uh, but necrocapitalism is that that the capitalism is using like also our own bodies. It's actually uh, taking the flesh. For example, if you look at the that the, po the po pure poor people, especially they are selling their livers or you know they are just flesh. They are not even like humans any longer. And uh, necro is exactly this kind of going uh, going and taking the human bodies uh, somehow in that way or yeah. Um, okay. It's, uh, it's thanks. also we are not we are not like uh, co 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 we are not living in consumerist uh, uh, society any longer, but we are becoming the uh, the, uh, the 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 products. Uh, uh, yeah, and this is what is happening uh, with us all the time. Like we are the the materials that are used. It's not how much we we buy, or but it's actually how much we produce that uh, can be sold. Actually, our likes, our you know like data, uh, etc., etc. I mean, it's just like we are the products, and this is like kind of uh, capitalism entering our own flesh somehow. Yeah, uh, Zuboff uh, calls that uh, surveillance capitalism, right? Um, but maybe I can paraphrase uh, uh, what you are thinking of with, uh, or what I then would be thinking of with necro capitalism is maybe not so much the direct uh, relationship with uh, death um, in uh, the individual, but uh, I think much simpler. Uh, one major feature of capitalism is that it externalizes cost. Uh, as long as uh, uh, a capitalist process can externalize cost, it tends to win. Uh, and externalizing costs uh, are things like uh, the destruction of nature that is not uh, uh, included in the cost of um, uh, building cell phones. Uh, because uh, what uh, mining coltan in um, the Congo does to the environment there is not what we pay for when we buy a cell phone. Yet it is definitely the cost of doing business. It's just not integrated into the cost of the cell phone, but it destroys the environment and it destroys people. So uh, it uh, kills them and capitalism doesn't care uh, because they don't have to care or they're not forced to care. But either way, thanks. Um, then uh, I've got another question. Um, you mentioned also early on that uh, uh, you believe that we should focus on the politicization of life. Uh, I totally agree. But how do you think we should do this? Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's a whole area to to be explored. Uh, I think that if we, I mean, no one ha has answers or all the tryouts that were done so far were either uh, uh, either very very quickly uh, appropriated in a way, and uh, therefore we are like kind of losing the energy to try again. But I think the the only way out is like experimenting with forms. Uh, of so, politicization, whatever but, that that means. Yeah. Yeah, like I see, I can just give like example, but this is like coming from my own field, uh, what I think or how I see it. Yeah, but I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like for me, it's like already like art is doing in or is trying to do so, but it's like it's reaching it's 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 very much elitistic sphere and it doesn't reach very like uh, actually the the public. Uh, it has like very limited uh, bourgeois uh, somehow or you know very well educated uh, population that uh, follows it, but it cannot reach the rest. Even if there are like uh, many projects done that would try to uh, enrich and go out or, you know, like embrace this kind of populations, it is uh, very limited to do so. Um, and I would say that uh, with, let's say, public 
public time. Uh, and of course, I believe that uh, volunteering is not a bad thing. Um, if, if you have like uh, um, material, uh, I mean, ability to, to, you know, dedicate your time to, to volunteer, which many people do not, of course, but those that, that have should or we should, and we are obliged to do so. And we are doing that, of course, but I think that with some kind of understanding um, of, uh, 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 you know, giving uh, people tools, uh, for example, to to fight back, uh, to say no to things, or you know, to to become stronger, to 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 voice, to 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 be able to voice themselves, or to go against uh, the exploitations or any kind. Uh, I mean, it's it's like it's really a huge topic. I think this this would be yeah. a possibility that. Uh, that this is like for me a politization. Politization of life, it's something that uh, you are emancipating uh, people. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I, I agree. Uh, but it, it's theory. Um, you're right, but it's not something tangible that we can deploy. Uh, case in point, emancipating people is exactly what happened before the British Brexit vote. Everyone felt emancipated and the majority voted in favor of Brexit. Uh, these people thought that they were actively involved in the, the political process. They were politicizing life, but it's hurting the very people that voted uh, in favor of Brexit. Were they? Were they? Were they, were they really? Like, yeah, but, they thought. Were they really? No, I don't think they were really, but that yes. is because we look into it from the outside. But for those people that were voting, they believed that they were. So you might have the theory, but the theory is easily subverted, which is exactly what happened in Brexit. It was subverted by people with more power. Uh, so yeah, where does this leave us? It leaves us in a position where we don't have the tools to make this happen uh, because we don't know what the tools are. We only know what the theory is. Uh, so that, yeah, so we're still with our backs against the wall, not knowing how we can make this happen, even though we have the theory, but that's not enough. Yeah, but uh, even so if you look, I mean, it is well, always, you know, a claim going back for at least like, I don't know, like, uh, you know, the student revolution in the 69 with great ideas that were appropriated and, you know, caused exactly. like worse and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, it's like it's not the technology that is bad, but it's the way we are like uh, we are using it is the wrong thing. And the way people think that they have their voice, it's it's not always the case that really they have a voice or that, that this voice is is public good uh, or is uh, is a voice for the public good. It's mm -hmm. very egocentric, uh, individualistic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like thinking, I mean, it's like, it's very complex thing, I think. Um, and it's not like an easy way out, but I think it's, uh, it's a possibility to fight or trying uh, to think about all the initiations uh, all around the, the world that are doing good and are kind of sometimes even winning some of the battles, maybe not the war, but at least the battles. But, but then I I'm going to put you on the spot, because now I want to know what some of these examples are. Mm. Uh, like uh, one of the, the recent uh, pro project initiation uh, is called uh, pirate, um, uh, pirate something, and uh, they had like initiations or different initi initiations and uh, uh, practices, um, uh, collecting uh, different practices and initiations around the Europe mainly, I think. When, where they're helping uh, like uh, people in shelters, uh, they're using like feminist approaches, uh, but I would now have to, Pirate Care is it called, the project? 
uh, and you can Google it out. Uh, for example, Pirates now, carry. Now I'm, hmm? Wait, could you repeat? What is the name of the project? I will write it down. Thanks. But it's something that is ongoing and uh, yeah, it's lasting for, I don't know, okay. two years already or something like that. Um, mm, I was just reading now that, uh, that, uh, uh, that in some, um, in some cities in Poland, actually they, uh, they went back to the, to, to the, to the, uh, how to say to the normal state that because uh, LGBT communities uh, were inhibited there, so they the the let's say the protests that were there and people were fighting against that they succeed, uh, but of course the fights are never ending. Uh, it's something that is an ongoing thing. I think you know for every battle that you get. There is an opportunity that you will, you will, uh, you they will take it. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, um, uh, and indeed, some battles uh, are being won. I'm not familiar with pirate care, but I do know that uh, I think three uh, cities, I think it was in um, Poland, uh, have managed to turn over the in, um, requirement from the state to uh, to prosecute uh, LGBTQI or something like this. So I'm yeah. aware of this. Um, um, but um, yeah, okay. Um, and, I would start... uh, okay, now now uh, another example. It's like indigenous people in uh, in the northern in Northern America, I think, uh, uh, because they were like the 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 ground or the uh, the land was taken away from them, and they were collecting money from from white people. And now they're buying their land back. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, indeed. I, I think there are many good examples to uh, yeah. to identify in uh, the Americas, particularly in relation to uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, your example is one. Um, I think bigger examples are, for example, that uh, Castillo became uh, president of Peru um, uh, in against uh, the wishes of the white population. Uh, the fact that uh, the um, um, the coup against uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia was overturned, and that Evo Morales is back and has taken over, or that his party has taken over the government again. Um, the fact that uh, indigenous peoples in Brazil are able to fight back on a level that reaches international uh, news outlets. So these are indeed good examples, but uh, of uh, how fighting back can be effective. Um, uh, but I think they show two things, and the first is that uh, it's about empowerment, uh, but also that uh, they can be, or there is room for success, because the discrepancy between those who oppress and those who are oppressed is huge. There is so much to be gained. Um, and in situations where the difference between uh, the haves and the have-nots is small but growing, uh, it's much harder to uh, to um, to empower these people and have them fight back because they are in a position where it's much harder for them to see that they are being suppressed, um, okay. which makes it harder to politicize life in that situation. Whereas it's much easier to politicize politicize life if your life expectancy is 45 because you live in the Amazon, whereas uh, if you go to the big city, it's 85. It's it's these these are not difficult things to see, but if you live in uh, let's say uh, under the smoke of, um, I don't know, um, under the smoke of uh, Frankfurt and your life expectancy is 72, but in Frankfurt itself, it's 76. Ah, well, that's a harder case to make uh, to fight against. All right. Anyway, uh, I'll stop there. Um, Babek, can I ask you a point about two of your questions? Sure. The two questions related to the commodification of the body and the politicization of life. Those were the outcomes of, the, of your questions. Now, if you think about life, and in this case, the body, you could substitute the body for, say, the tree. So if you think about commodification of the tree, it's what we've done historically, you know, through millennia. But then you think about the 
politicization of the tree, great vistas open up that haven't been explored. So I think it's a useful metaphor to bring those two against each other. Yeah, um, I think it is an interesting discussion. And I, well, with trees, uh, well, actually, I think with trees, it's also, uh, it has been done, right? But with rivers, particularly um, in some places, uh, they have been given uh, natural rights, right? Um, so they have um, been put on par, some rivers, uh, with um, uh, uh, humans and rights, uh, and the same for uh, a few other natural features that now escape me. Um, yeah, yeah. So they're personifications. But then, but That's a personification of a tree. What I'm saying, or a river, rather, what I'm saying is that we're finding that trees have consciousness way outside of what ours may be, and we can't even reach that. It's way beyond any kind of thinking that we have. It's freeing that up to speak independently rather than put a human construct on it uh, as a mechanism for understanding it. That's what I mean. I right. Mean, there it, might be yeah. a, point in a time in the future when trees can actually express themselves. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, th this is a little bit also like uh, the question of how do we communicate with aliens, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, yeah, it's a, it's a valid point. Yeah. But I don't have an answer, right? Um, but it also touches on uh, necro capitalism. If we externalize the cost, uh, um, then uh, those that have the ability to uh, abuse uh, the natural world will not care about uh, the consequences outside of their responsibility, whether trees have uh, consciousness or not, uh, or what kind of consciousness trees have or not. Well, that's the commodification of trees right there under that label. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. But it's an argument for the politicization of life, not so much from the view of humans, but from the point of view of trees. Yeah, yeah. It's a more liberating I, I, question yes. that hasn't really been researched. I think, so I think it's more, more agency, this idea of, of uh, politicization in relation to trees than it is in, in relation to the, to the bodies, which we tend to think of it. I think to, to put that a different way, they begin to open up a whole different way of thinking, which we haven't yet approached even, we haven't even begun, we haven't given words to it or anything. Well, actually, um, this reminds me of something else. Um, in you know, Dutch Parliament has a party with uh, five or six seats out of 150 that is called the Party of the Animals. <laughs> and, 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 you know, they're a left, strongly left-leaning party, but uh, they first came to Parliament uh, by advocating for the rights of animals, specifically and primarily. So, uh, and I mentioned this because the, the underlying problem, I think, is that if you, uh, if we accept the politicization of uh, life, um, then who is going to speak up for the rivers and the trees and the mountains and whatnot, right? Um, the the trees know. and the mountains and the rivers are going to speak up, that's the point. Well, yeah, hopefully, but at the moment they, they don't, right? Because we don't know how to talk. No, but that's what we use our skill in order to facilitate that, not to speak they for them. Speak. <laughs> they do speak already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah. But we don't recognize that, right? Um, oh, we uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, so, but where is the party of the trees in the Parliament of Slovenia, right? So, I understand your point, but uh, it, yeah, the voice that they have is uh, not uh, does not play a role in economic life. Well, it does play a role in economic life, but not in the same way as you and I do. Or uh, yeah, or, it's because of animated thinking. We we can't comprehend what they're contributing right now, except yeah. in terms of carbon dioxide and altruism, what have you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Anyway, so um, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, no, I do understand, uh, let's say, the complexity of it, especially uh, the paradox of how to make a natural law that is uh, beyond humans and that is uh, made by humans. But it is actually a tendency, a more than a tendency, a reality in, in law practice today, that we are going away from a law of ecology, a law, a law that protects nature, to a natural law where a holistic view on, on um, um, let's say, well, uh, that's uh, planetary rights, you cannot call it human rights anymore, are seen as uh, something um, the obvious, uh, that uh, law is not only restricted to human, uh, or the protection at least of uh, our rights are not mm -hmm. anymore limited to the human realm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, we are going to 
one and a half hour of uh, fascinating discussion. Um, does somebody else wants to add something? I see we have some more people in the room. Uh, maybe you want to share something of your thoughts or have some feedback or comment or a question. Um, or if not, somebody else has an, a last question he would like to bring in to Yasmina or to anybody. Then I would like to thank you for inviting me to give this lecture, like also to Zona, to Irene Brane, and you that were hosting this lecture, and also for all everyone who was like posing a question or just listening and staying with us here today in this kind of virtual uh, room. And I hope that maybe someday or soon we will meet in in a live form. <laughs> back again <laughs> in physical space and time.